All right, happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to TGI Kubernetes. I'm your host this week for the new year. My name is Joe Bita. I am a principal engineer here at VMware. Um, and this is episode 141, which is absolutely crazy, by the way, of TGI Kubernetes. Um, uh, for those who are not aware, this is a weekly-ish live stream where me or one of my uh, uh, compatriots here at uh, VMware uh, just talk about Kubernetes stuff. Um, uh, oftentimes, we'll explore new projects, go deep, but we've been playing around with expanding into other formats, uh, perhaps talking about the latest release, that type of thing. Um, and so uh, we started this when I was uh, a co-founder at Heptio and we're continuing it now. And our, our focus by and large is very much on the Kubernetes community and open source. I'll mention some of the stuff that's happening here at VMware, but that's really, really not the focus of what we're doing here. Um, so the way the format works here is I start off by saying hello to everybody. And, uh, and I'm always, always excited to see all the different places that people are calling in from or saying hello from, from around the world. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of a review around some of what's been happening around the Kubernetes ecosystem. And then we're going to dig into a specific project. And this week, we're going to be digging into the uh, CDK uh, for Kubernetes, which is the what, what does CDK stand for? I don't even know. Kubernetes Cloud Development Kit for Kubernetes, which is, I think, going to be really exciting. So first off, Chaim is calling from uh, is uh, is here from Israel. Nice to see you, uh, Rodolfo Morteza uh, uh, from Tehran. Awesome, Bohunk. I I'm sure. Like, if you can say in the comments, like how to how to pronounce your name. I'm not sure how to do the J there. But uh, uh, good to see you. Happy 2021. Justin, uh, good to see you. Are you involved in the CDK development stuff or are you just sort of a interested party from AWS? Um, regardless, uh, you know, just uh, again, want to say I love the, the talk that you did at KubeCon. You clearly put a boatload of work on that into that. Um, Sevi, nice to see you. Suresh, Walid, welcome back. Good to see you. Um, Jose, Yosef, uh, KR, KR4, uh, Steve, how's it going, Steve? Uh, Martin from the Netherlands. Um, and let's see, uh, Elko from Holland, Yuka from Helsinki, Gabriel, Gabriel from Brazil, Otome, Dan, uh, Jose, Fully Geared Bear. Awesome, Yatin from uh, Virginia. Awesome. Okay, so Justin, you're the developer advocate for it and a user, but here to learn. Okay. Well, I was hoping that you could tell me where I'm screwing up, but we'll figure it out together. Marco from Italy. Okay, I got. I, I you know this is so much fun for me to see everybody. Just huge hello. Um, I, I want to do a, a quick shout out and thank you to Paul uh, Sorzowski, who uh, I'm sure I'm bittering your name, Paul, who's been helping with a lot of the pre-work, making sure that we're set, putting in some of the URLs and, and uh, checking on the AV and all that. So why don't we go ahead and jump in and start going through uh, what's happening. Oh, Lamadi, good to see you. Let me uh, start going through... Uh, some of the some of the things we can review, and if you all have ideas on, um, so so what we can do is uh, tgik.io/notes. I'm putting the the link in here. I meant to sort of figure out a way to do it with the OBS, but I, I didn't have enough time to fight with OBS to get that link up there. That actually is uh, sort of crowdsource notes, and so that's what I'm actually uh, that's HackMD awesome service. That's uh, what I'm actually uh, projecting right now here. Um, so yeah, so um, core Kubernetes, not a lot has happened since last TGIK. I think everybody really just sort of wound down over the last couple of weeks of the year. And uh, you know, uh, 2021 started off with a bang. I don't know if anybody's had their mind on Kubernetes really, to be honest. Um, hey, Tiffany, good to see you. Uh, but like uh, Paul pulled out there some some interesting oh we got, we lost a uh, huh so some of the things didn't autocomplete here I'm not sure what happened there but we um, we have some good links here in terms of um, like why did that not do its thing HT oh you know what 
it's reversed. Um, we got some good links here in terms of a set of blog posts of some of the features that actually came with uh, 1.20. And so I think this is a, a little bit of sort of completing the uh, and so let's go through these real quick. I mean, these are kind of like, you know, we're getting into the weeds here, but it's, I think it's really interesting to see this is the type of things that we're doing. This is really like, for example, when a CSI driver needs to mount credentials, uh, you know, how do we actually do that and have it impersonate the pod in a safe way? So really starting to find, you know, the ways that we can really start limiting credentials and really start to, to tighten things down. So this is really interesting here. Um, uh, so that's one talking about like using uh, uh, different APIs and different ways to do this. Um, uh, third, uh, uh, and this is mostly for like, how do you go through and um, have a CSI driver that's actually putting credentials, not for Kubernetes, but for other things into a volume, but have it actually use the, the credentials of that particular pod to be able to do it. Uh, Antonia, good to see you. Um, and so, uh, so this is really, this is interesting. Third party device metrics reaches GA. And I think this is interesting from sort of a, a, a larger arc. I think by and large Kubernetes is a whole bunch of things, right? But like the, the, the core of it for most users is around containers and how do you launch and monitor containers? And, um, and you know, when we think about containers, the big footprint that we think about is really, you know, compute, storage, and networking. And as you look across what Kubernetes does, so much of what it's doing is really about how do you isolate the amount of compute that you have, which is CPU and RAM, how do you allocate and assign storage to it, and then how do you make networking work in this super dynamic environment that Kubernetes sits in. And so that's sort of the hard problems that Kubernetes is solving. But, you know, when we think about the, the sort of like the resources on a machine, we generally think RAM and CPU usage. Uh, but, you know, computers are more complicated than that. And we're starting to see uh, things like GPUs. And this is why NVIDIA ends up being sort of coming into the picture here, uh, being one of those things where it's like, well, how do you share a GPU in a cont containerized environment? And, and so, you know, there's ways to do that, but we're starting to see you know, that being, you know, uh, 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 really fully fleshed across all the different parts of Kubernetes. And I think this is exciting. And it just doesn't end with GPUs. I mean, we have GPUs, we have special machine learning, uh, things like TPUs, um, there's FPGAs. There's gonna be, you know, over time, more and more special purpose hardware that we're gonna want to expose through Kubernetes. And so um, seeing this being done in a generic way versus just hard coding GPUs is really interesting to me. Um, very cool. Um, and then this is a granular control of volume permission changes. I, I haven't had a chance to really read through this, but the idea here is that when you mount a volume, how do you actually uh, deal with mapping user IDs and group IDs into, into Linux? And so um, that's really cool. And so, uh, you know, again, this is one of those things where, you know, we, we have this world that the kernel knows and we have the world inside containers and just really dialing down all the different configuration metrics that we need across these things. All right. And then larger ecosystem. This is where uh, some, some more fun stuff happens. Um, Kubernetes image policy webhook explained. And so this is... Um, uh, this is essentially starting to look at how you can actually start implementing image policies using a webhook to be able to actually do that. And so uh, using OPA and um, uh, and so it actually it's replacing the, uh, the image policy webhook with a validating admission webhook. So this is, I think, a great example about how, you know, we, we have relatively um, uh, 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 relatively narrow extension capabilities that are now actually being uh, you know, supplanted with more generic things like OPA. And so this is really interesting. And I think this will talk to one of the other articles that we have coming up around sort of like Kubernetes makes it really easy to run things, which is great. 
but it also makes it really easy to run things, which is also dangerous. And so in a production setting, you may not want to let, you know, developers or even yourself accidentally download and run random containers from random locations without actually having controls over what you're running and why you're running it. Um, and so this is a key capability to be able to do this. And this starts to be one of those things where when you start using um, a distribution or sort of a higher level framework for Kubernetes, like some of the stuff that we're doing in Tanzu, we help you to actually go ahead and configure this type of thing very easily. But all the pieces are there, you know, and there's, there's multiple ways to skin this cat. We have one way that, we, that we're working through it uh, using uh, uh, OPA and Gatekeeper. Um, uh, but there, there are multiple ways to do that, and you don't have to actually go with a sort of fully formed commercial solution to be able to implement these extensions and really get these benefits. Alex, good to see you from North California. Now, when you say North California, this is something that always confused me, because there's North California, which is truly North California, and then there's the San, Fr San Francisco Air, uh, Bay Area, whereas if you look at California, it's kind of in the middle. But Central California means a Central Valley, and real North, true North California is really, what, Southern Oregon? I don't even know. <laughs> but it's something that always confused me that San Francisco was Northern California. All right, so that's really cool. Um, and then the next thing that I wanna like, I'll skip around here a little bit. Uh, north of San Jose, okay. Uh, is there, there's this article, um, let's see, uh, from Dan here. Uh, and this is really long, I'm not gonna go through all of it. That really drives home the point of, of you know, how easy it is to install a lot of stuff on Kubernetes. And, you know, uh, how, <laughs> Uh, and then the dangers of that. And so this is essentially a tracing of installing a Helm chart and starting to map all the thing that it, things that it pulls in. And so I think, you know, the, the, the name of the game over, say, the next, you know, year or so, and we're going to see a lot of talk about this, is, you know, I don't know exactly the terms that people are going to be using, but I think we're going to call it, how do you secure the supply chain? And the supply chain is this, you know, um, all the bits and pieces that actually go into the code that's actually running on your machine. And so it's everything from the source code, the compilers and systems used to build that, how it gets packaged up, the dependencies that go into those packages. When you're actually writing code, if you're using Java or JavaScript or what have you, or Go, you're pulling in dependencies in terms of libraries. And then you're producing those images and you wanna make sure that the things that you're actually running are the things that you're producing. So that's the entire supply chain. And so this started with things like, um, you know, the, the node system where like, you know, you can't write a node app without pulling in hundreds of dependencies. That's something where all of a sudden people started getting really paranoid and there were examples of bad actors taking over some of those things. Um, but clearly the latest uh, uh, thing is SolarWinds, um, which was really a supply chain attack, which was really scary, where somebody essentially, uh, um, uh, you know, ended up uh, uh, infiltrating them and then using that to actually uh, in, inject a backdoor essentially or an agent into their agent so that they could actually use them as a carrier to be able to infect others. Really scary stuff and I think Kubernetes is not immune and in some ways makes this uh, super easy to ignore and that's not a good thing. And so I think this is something that we're gonna be seeing over time more and more concentration of. And Alex says, sounds like a tough problem. Yeah, okay, so the, uh, so that's a pun there. I'll explain that for you all. So there is this uh, uh, CNCF project called the Update Framework, um, which is essentially a mechanism of how you actually sign images to make sure that the images that you're running are exactly what you're running, depending on how they actually get moved around. Um, but supply chain goes beyond just signing. It's really about being able to understand everything that goes into that. So there's other projects in the CNCF like in Toto, which actually help to, to, to track everything that goes in there. And so there's a really a lot of really interesting work going on in this space, I think. Uh, uh, and it's, it's one of those things where there's no one solution. It's about a defense in depth monitoring all of this. But this actually is like, you know, if you really want to understand the 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 sort of the depth and the complexity of like oh i'm just installing a helm chart this goes into sort of the excruciating detail of actually figuring that stuff out and then that again play starts playing into the image policies where now you might say like wow i don't want to install random 
run random uh, containers. Instead, maybe I'll have essentially an allow list of containers or containers that are hosted in this registry or this prefix or signed by this thing. That's the type of thing that we can do. So the super micro supply chain hack, this is really interesting, is um, uh, the, uh, um, the, you know, I don't know if that was real or not. I think there, there had, there was a lot of speculation that that there was a, you know, that the 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 sourcing of that article wasn't really solid, and so I don't know if that was actually really ever verified. Um, um, Antonio, what are your thoughts on the security cards originally to provide information about security char characteristics of the packages? With security cards for which packages? Are you thinking, Antonia? All right, so I'll keep going. We can we can definitely go. Okay, so if you missed it, and I did miss it, I haven't had a chance to watch it. There's the great CNCF Bake Off, um, and uh, here's the video. I, I need to find some time to actually go back and watch this, but like, this was really great, and I think this really speaks to the Kubernetes community in that you know we're at this time where everybody's feeling isolated. They're searching for community. And here we have people coming together, having essentially a, you know, virtual bake off and hanging out. And, and uh, oh, look, there's some nice bourbon going on there, which is really, really cool to see. And I know a lot of work went into the into the community uh, celebration. And this was a this was a big part of it. So if you want to get a sense of the Kubernetes community, that's a great place to go. OK, so. Um, Yeah, and then Paul was running a lot of those things behind the scenes. So thanks for that, Paul. All right, neat and short video, the chaos engineering Kubernetes using Cube Invaders. So, <laughs> so this is really fun. And I think we've seen a de definitely a bunch of um, examples of people building games with the Kubernetes API in the back end. Um, I love the combination of this combined with Space Invaders to actually say, well, let me go ahead and shoot something literally shoot something, but also have it actually kill the system behind the scenes. And so that's really, really interesting. Um, and uh, it reminds me of, I think, you know, the, the Google folks at one KubeCon had essentially a, a, a whack-a-mole, a physical whack-a-mole game where you could whack the mole, but when you whack the mole, it would actually kill a pod. And that would actually go ahead and have the, uh, the, the pod recreated and actually reflected by the mole coming back up, which was really funny. Um, yeah, let's see, uh, media server operator. I, you know, I need to play with this stuff at one point because this looks really cool. You know, I think what we see is that, you know, installing and running something like Plex can be uh, complicated, but, you know, here's actually doing it on top of Kubernetes, being able to bring all of these things together. So that looks really interesting. Speaking of running random stuff, but... <laughs> Oftentimes, if I'm going to start running something like this, I'll actually go in and start looking at what's happening under the covers because that's just sort of my way of doing stuff is that I want to definitely know what I'm running and dig into the details before I run it. So that looks really interesting. Um, cool. And then there's the uh, what's the helm article. Yeah. And then the other thing, and I haven't, you know, totally like read everything is, you know, about it is Red Hat acquiring Stack Rocks is obviously some of the news of the week, too. Um, so, you know, more consolidation and acquisitions in this space, which is um, always something that's happening. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So uh, 18 minutes in. Um, let's go ahead. Oh, somebody added some notes here. So uh, uh, the, the, the cloud development kit for Kubernetes. Um, so this is an open source project that is sponsored and driven by um, let me sort of yeah by uh, uh, our friends at AWS, and I believe and, and Justin correct me if I'm wrong that you know CDK there there are multiple sort of there's the AWS cloud development kit, which is kind of a similar thing for for uh, for managing um, uh, 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 AWS stuff. So taking the same ideas with AWS CDK and applying those things to Kubernetes. And so I think this actually ends up driving um, uh, uh, this ends up driving a, uh, not to cloud formation, right? 
whereas the CDK for Kubernetes ends up drawing Kubernetes manifest. But the general idea is that, you know, we, we've created this world where, um, where to run any of these systems in the cloud, whether it be AWS or Kubernetes or, you know, other clouds, it's a lot of configuration. And that configuration starts out feeling very easy, but it often gets out of control. And so this was really like, you know, when we think about wrangling YAML and how everybody sort of hates YAML, and I have a, a, a talk that I did back around Halloween to really start, start working on this, to, to talk about this in context of Kubernetes, you know, part of the problem is YAML itself. There are definitely like Tim, Tim Hawken had an example of a change in the way that YAML handled uh, octal numbers, uh, it, you know, uh, and, it, you know, in, in, in terms of the formatting over the last uh, over a minor release of the YAML spec. Um, so YAML itself has problems, but I think the, the core problem here is that there are a lot of knobs to turn and, the, and, and keeping track of which knobs you're setting in which way across a whole bunch of different areas is a hard problem, whether you're talking about cloud formation or Kubernetes or what have you. And so this is a, you know, uh, 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 a, a, you know, one way that we're going to be digging into in terms of how do you actually express that configuration, work with it and deal with it. Um, uh, oh yeah, so uh, if you're looking for the the notes that was at, I'll, I'll put it on, on here, uh, tgik.io slash notes, we'll get you there. Um, uh, and then there's a T, uh, the CDK for Terraform that generates HCL because it turns out that, you know, the, there's there's raw YAML and then there's, you know, things that are sort of semi-structured and templated, whether you're talking about Helm charts or something like, you know, what, what uh, 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 VMware is investing in this project called Carvel and YTT. Uh, we did an episode on that. Um, CDK, you know, whether it's for Kubernetes or other things, really falls into the camp of like, you know, why trying to make, make this look like dumb data? Just go ahead and let's write code to be able to generate it. And so the idea is that uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing programs and those programs will generate the YAML. And so it's like at a certain level, you think about this and you're like, this is crazy. I have to write a program to deploy my program. Uh, but, um, but really, like as you get more complex, yeah, it's not actually... Uh, a bad idea to think about writing a program to deploy your program. And I think this is one of the reasons why this has been so hard over time is that, you know, for simple things, this is going to feel like something like CDK is going to feel really over and uh, over engineered, right? Because you're setting up a whole project in a program just to generate some YAML so that you can deploy your real program. Um, <laughs> Whereas, like, by the time you get to more complex things that you're really deploy, you're like, yeah, I really want a real programming language to be able to do this. And so this is why we kind of keep going in circles here. And I'm convinced in this space that there is a no one size fits all solution for actually deciding how do you actually define and turn all these knobs. But instead, we have to have a set of solutions and you have to pick the right one for the for the problem space that you're in. Um, and so this is on the end of the more sort of like use a real programming language. Other solutions that would be sort of in the same class would be something like Pulumi, um, which I think we've done an episode on Pulumi also, which again is this idea of let's use uh, uh, real languages to be able to define this stuff. Now, one of the interesting things as I was digging into CDK earlier is that it doesn't actually deploy things. All it does, um, well, Pulumi, Pulumi will use some of the Terraform providers under the covers, um, but, uh, uh, but it also knows how to actually talk Kubernetes uh, explicitly. Um, yeah, so, 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 the, so there's a, the difference between the CDK for Kubernetes and Pulumi is that the CDK for Kubernetes just produces the YAML. It's still up to you to figure out how and where do you actually apply that YAML. Whereas Pulumi is more like Terraform, where it's both the templating and sort of the resolution of a higher language thing into the raw stuff, including the actual application of that thing onto the target that you're talking about. And so I actually like the idea of, hey, we're producing the YAML as a separate step from applying to the YAML, because in my mind, that feels more like a tool chain. It feels more composable. 
And so that's why, you know, with Carvel, our, you know, the, the project that is more of a templating solution here, um, it's actually split into a set of sub projects where one of those things is the uh, uh, producing the YAML, which is YTT. Another one of those things is applying the YAML. In that case, it's CAP. Um, but now we can actually use the, the, the CDK for Kubernetes. Well, how do you guys say it? Do you see CDKs? Um, we can use that in combination with something like CAP. And so it's not a sort of an all or nothing type of thing when you pick these solutions. We, 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 I think we're starting to, to figure out how do we create a world where you can start mix and matching these things in some interesting ways. Um, let me read through the comments here. Um, uh, Morteza says, with CD, 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 Kates, you can generate code that generates YAML. Okay. <laughs> um, so Raja Silan, now I got to learn TypeScript as well. Yeah, see, that's one of the, the sort of the things. If you know TypeScript, this is going to feel very, very natural. Um, there's also Python and Java support here. We're going to be getting into that a little bit. Um, uh, in terms of how to actually pick between these things, I think it's really like, you know, it depends on how complex a configuration you're going to need to be going with. Um, and again, that's, I think, is one of those one size doesn't fit all solutions in this space. Hello, Nova. Good to see you. We're just getting into things. Hope your interview went well. Okay, so let's go through and get started. I um, uh, The docs are, are pretty good here, and I started going through it a little bit earlier. Um, uh, this just goes through a little bit of what, what I, was, I was talking about. Um, we're going to go through the sort of getting started here. Now, one of the things is that you got to install. There's a command line uh, for CDKs. Um, oh, you're going to have to duck out on us again for more interviews. OK. Um, uh, so there's a command line for CDKs that you install. It's a node-based command line. Um, which I always hate node-based command lines because like node, like, I don't know. I always have a semi-broken node in configuration. It feels like there's always like so much work just like getting node working, but there you go. But that's just the tool itself. You can then use that to actually generate the frameworks for TypeScript, Python, and Java. And if you start looking under the covers, you know, I, I suspect that there's room to extend this to other languages and other types of things later. Um, it's called Node for a reason. Oh, very funny. Uh, uh, folks are asking when you're going to do another TGIK episode, Nova. We got to have you on at some point again. Um, yeah. So, so you know, feedback, Justin. I would prefer a a, a, a uh, um, I would prefer a static binary. I had to upgrade and fight with Node before this episode to be able to get it working. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that. I think I have. Um, I have it, let me go through an npm uninstall, and we'll go through and see what it actually looks like as we go through this experience here. Is this gonna work? Audited, how do I, how do you deinstall? Oh, anyways, I have the thing installed. So I, I essentially did npm install, and that'll, Yeah, Brew does a good job, but one of the things that Brew had me do is I the first time I ran npm, it's like update your npm. I did that, and then it gave me an error, and so like I was swearing at at, at Node at that point. Okay, so we had the CDK command line installed, um, and you do this, and it um, it really has three commands here. So it has importing stuff, and we'll get into what importing actually means. It really means generate the library and the framework from the schema that you're working with. Um, there's initiating a project, which is kind of like a, you know, um, what is the, the Rails command? The, the Rails command to say, like, start me a scaffold project. And then there's synth, which means essentially run your program to generate the YAML. And so these are different layers and different things that we'll be going through here. So I am going to go through, I think, you know, let's, we're going to start with TypeScript. I don't know TypeScript really at all, so I'm going to be fumbling my way through this stuff. Um, and uh, and I think we might be able to do Python. I didn't bother getting a JVM all set up for this, so I don't think we're going to do the Java stuff. But we'll start with at least uh, TypeScript, and then we'll we'll go for there from there. Um, so we we got this thing installed. Um, for those who are not familiar with Node, the dash G says install it globally versus install it as a local project. Just an FYI. 
Um, and again, this is one of those stumbling blocks, whereas I think folks who sort of like have been dealing with the with the sort of the, the JavaScript world forever, just assume that everybody knows how like NPM and package.json and all that stuff works. And like, you know, folks like me who don't work in that world, every time I do it, I'm like, you know, it's always an exercise in frustration. Um, but, we're, but you can watch me get frustrated here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, NPM is the new Maven, exactly. All right, and so we're going to create a, a thing called, uh, if I don't have it already, um, oh wait, what do I have? I don't want any of this. Okay, so so we have it, oh, I installed it locally. See, I, I forgot to put the dash G on there. So now, okay, uh, make their hello, CD hello. And then we're gonna do init TypeScript app. So if we do CD Kate's uh, init help, you can see and uh, there's Java, Python, and TypeScript are the apps that we can be that we're able to do. So we're gonna do init TypeScript app. Now one of the interesting things here, um, and this is just sort of the um, I think a lot of this is inspired by Rails, honestly, is this idea of, of you know, DRY, right? Dry, don't repeat yourself. Um, and what you're gonna see is, is that what's happening here is this is doing a whole bunch of stuff and it's actually importing and running the, uh, the, the, the um, creating the, the, the Kubernetes target uh, schemas and libraries. It's creating some scaffolding. So it's essentially creating a project and getting it all set up for us. Um, but you're like, well, what is the project named? And so if we go into VS Code here um, and look at, so here's all the stuff that it actually created for us. We have all sorts of fascinating things, including like a git ignore, you know, a help file that tells you how to do stuff. So this is like, this starts to feel like a heavy duty project. We have like, you know, the, um, package.json is all set up for us with our dependencies. The TypeScript configuration is all set up. So there's a lot of stuff that's actually going on here to be able to get going. Um, but there's a main file here called, uh, well, there, if we look at package.json, you can see it's called hello. Where did hello come from? Well, it's like, hey, I'm gonna assume that whatever directory you're in is the name of the project or the, the thing that you're actually doing. And so uh, there's a lot of that sort of like, you know, look around and try and do something sensible based on sort of what you're seeing that's going on here. And so the, the main thing that we're actually got going on here is, um, this is not, why is it asking me about Python instead of TypeScript? Weird, okay, I don't care, um, go away. Um, is essentially what this is, is this is a program in TypeScript that when you run it will generate some YAML. Um, and that's really everything that's going on here. And we'll start to, to, to dig under the covers here. But this, this is sort of like, if we, if we do this, we have to do a NPM run compile. What this will actually do is this will go through, take the TypeScript and compile it into JavaScript. Um, and then if we go NPM run synth, this under the covers we'll actually call uh, cdkates.synth. This then runs the JavaScript program to be able to generate the YAML. So we're running the TypeScript compiler to generate JavaScript, and then we're running JavaScript to generate YAML. And we still haven't applied anything to a cluster. We're still just creating YAML to be able to get going here. And, um, and the, the output file here is called uh, uh, dist hello and it's empty because there's actually nothing there yet. So we essentially have something running. Now, one of the things that we can actually do here is uh, we can do, um, let's create a new window here. Um, a CD uh, cat help. Um, what we can do is we can do npm run watch and what this actually says is, is um, anytime you change any of the TypeScript, just go ahead and automatically regenerate the, the JavaScript behind the scenes there. 
Um, and so this is one of those things that we're seeing here, NPM run watch, okay? And so, uh, so we've gone ahead and done that. Here's what we got. Um, we did the CDKates synth, and then we find that the thing's empty, right? So that's what we thought here. Now, this, um, this is where I'm starting to get past sort of my, my, my deep familiarity with, with this particular project. There's a couple of things that are going on here. So number one is that uh, uh, the core of what CDKates does is it takes the schema definitions for Kubernetes and then generates libraries out of those things that make it easy to be able to manipulate and deal with these things. Um, and that's done automatically when we actually did the init. And so what you can see here is that if I go back up, no, too far, too far, where, where was it? Where we did the init. Oh, here we go. It did CDK's import of Kubernetes, right? And so that actually, that was the step where it generated stuff. And what that ended up generating, oh, I, I have this thing cut off because there we go. What that uh, ended up generating was imports here, which these are the libraries. This is the Kubernetes library that essentially says, well, here's all the various Kubernetes types and generating essentially a bunch of, of uh, strongly typed you know, structures that we can start working with here. And so this is a huge file to be able to do this. And this is not an unusual pattern in these types of tools. If you look at the way something like Q works, which is another specialized language for templating and the way it works with Kubernetes, it'll go through and take the Kubernetes schema and then generate a bunch of helper libraries and structures around it. Uh, the original case sonnet did this also. And so this is a very common pattern to be able to essentially generate true language helpers in an automated way based on the schema that you're actually seeing on the other side. Um, and so let's see, if we look at import uh, TS, this thing is um, 20,000 lines of code, right? And that's that's essentially creating all the structure around the, 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 the Kubernetes API. So the next thing then is we actually are gonna start working with that. And so that's importing. Now you can do this with the raw Kubernetes stuff, but the interesting thing, and I, and I, you know, I hope that we have time to get into it, is that this can also apply to CRDs. And I think that's a really important thing as we're looking at these solutions is that Kubernetes is not just the built-in Kubernetes API. You also want solutions that can deal with the extended set of APIs and the extension that built, that's built into Kubernetes. And so any tooling that only works with the built-in APIs is probably gonna fall down as people still building more and more things extended on top of Kubernetes. Um, okay, and so let's copy and paste this thing here. So this is, and we'll go through sort of what's different here and what's going on. So this is gonna create a deployment in a service uh, around and um, and what you're seeing here is that this is um, we're importing from that you know that that twenty thousand line file we're importing cube deployment cube service and interstring okay so interstring is there's this place and this is um it's probably a bad decision in the original Kubernetes API but there's some places in the YAML where it can either be a string or it can be an integer and oftentimes we you know, we put in there early on support for named ports where you could say, I want to connect to this thing on this port. Well, you could either use the number or you could use essentially a name that is a logical name. I think in hindsight, the naming probably is underutilized and we probably shouldn't have bothered doing it and we should have just gone with raw ports, but like we're, we're, we're at where we're at right now, really. Um, all right, and so what you can see is that we're creating a service um, and there's some stuff that's built in like, like uh, there's the, uh, the scope, um, which I, I wanna understand a little bit more about what that means. I think that means that it's within this, this, uh, this larger uh, chart. There's this concept of charts that I don't fully grok in C.E. Cates. Um, there's the ID, which is essentially the name. And then there's all the property that, that go with that, including, and so that now we start seeing, you know, type equals load balancer. And so then cube service, if we go to the definition here, and this is in that case.ts, what you can see is um, it's just, it's a service of V1. It helps to actually get a bunch of the sort of block and tackle stuff filled out for you. 
Um, and so here's sort of that definition there. And so, um, so here we have a, a service, and then we have a deployment here, um, which says, okay, we're gonna have two replicas. Uh, we have, um, let's see, label is, there's a single label that actually gets set on all of this stuff. And so this is one of the things where we're starting to see some real JavaScript come out is that we have this structure of labels, app equal, you know, app goes to hello Kubernetes. And instead of repeating yourself across the YAML, this is one of the things that makes writing Kubernetes YAML really annoying. You can essentially create a variable and then reuse that in a bunch of places without having to redefine it manually. Um, we could have done the same thing here with, you know, const port equals 8080. Uh, uh, and gone ahead and done this also, right? So there you go. Um, and so you can see how like, as you start doing this, you can start using real programming constructs to really start to collapse this stuff down and make it easier to use. Um, yeah, Rajisalan, I, I think you're, you're exactly right. I think it's one of these things where TypeScript and JavaScript, like these things are universal and there is a certain assumption of, of familiarity across all sorts of different domains. And there's a lot to learn from that ecosystem. There's a lot of really interesting and good stuff there. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can start to do this, but like one of the things that I think, you know, you should come away here is that like, this doesn't fundamentally simplify things. There's still a lot of knobs. This is just a different way of setting those knobs. And so this is not, you know, you still have to understand that a deployment has a template that is different from the selectors and that you know, the raw Kubernetes schema is still exposed to you here for good or ill, at least with the level of the CDKs that we're dealing with right now. All right, so we go ahead and we have this and what we're seeing is that, you know, well, hmm, behind the scenes, theoretically, okay, so it's, uh, did it actually compile? So I think it, it compiled, yeah, okay. So now if we go through and if we cat main.js, this is the, this is essentially the JavaScript version of that TypeScript. So it, ha it did get compiled. Um, so now what we can do is now we have the JavaScript. Now we actually want to go through and we want to generate the, uh, the, the YAML. Uh, so we can go CDKs and then synth is the uh, does that now if I do dist dot hello dot yaml look at that woohoo we have yaml so it all get compiled down and there we go well lead suggesting that chef used to do Ruby 101 that is enough to use chef I guess we need to do do lots of TS to yeah you don't I don't think you need to be an expert in TypeScript to be able to do this stuff for sure um, Yosef, could we extend customize it for OpenShift resources? Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert in OpenShift. What I will say is that, you know, I know that OpenShift 4 is really built around operators and CRDs. And so there's no reason to think that this wouldn't work against those also. Um, so yeah, so there we go. So that, so we're up and running. I mean, and this thing is actually like, Hey, there's nothing to complain about. We actually have things have things working. Now, there's a couple of interesting things here that I think are worth looking at. Number one is that the name actually has this hash on the end of it. And I'm not sure where that hash came from. That's really interesting because the name that I passed here, Justin's, am I gonna go? Yeah, so I wanna talk about sort of like, now this is a set of primitives that we can use then to actually do higher level things including the CD, CD Kates Plus and uh, generating your own sort of like wrappers that start to, to now start to simplify this stuff down a little bit. Um, so let's start digging in because I don't know where the um, cube service manifest return props super so I just want to see where that name comes from. Scope ID string in the constructor. Is this a API object? Go to definition. Where is this actually defined? How does this work? This is my, go to implementations maybe. 
Okay, so here we have API objects extends. Maybe I'm crazy. Okay, so all right. Well, I'm not going to dig into this too much, but I do think it's interesting, and I don't quite understand. And maybe it actually talks about it. Why, where this CHC stuff comes from? But I guess. So there's a couple of things that I have questions about, and I think, you know, just notes that I, things that I would want to actually dig into that I don't totally understand. Number one is that like, okay, we gave it a name. Why is that name not used? It, it, clearly there's something, you know, a hash or something being added to the end of it. The other thing is that oftentimes you're going to want to provide parameters as you do this expansion here. And so I don't know, is there a way to actually, when you're calling synth, to, to actually pass in some command line arguments that it can then go ahead and use. And that's not something that I saw quickly looking through this stuff. Um, but the next thing now is that like, okay, we can go through and we can start packaging these things up into reusable components that we can parameterize. And so this is an example of like, we can create now a new web service thing that we can then go ahead and customize. And so the next sort of, um, extension here is that we can create a file called libwebservice.ts. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Um, and so there's a convention here. Ooh, what do we got going on here? Node modules, I didn't want to do that. Imports, okay, we don't see lib yet. Uh, make dir lib. So now we can go through and go uh, new file. What are we calling it? web-service.ts. And now I'm going to copy and paste this in here. I think the name needs to be passed in the option, otherwise generate a suffix name. Okay. Oh, I see. So the ID ends up being different than, than it. okay, gotcha. So I see. So the name ends up being a default. So let's go ahead and let's, let's play with that real quick just to be able to see. I can put that in there. But now what you're saying is that if I do, if I do metadata, name foo that'll override yeah okay there you go I see okay so what we're passing in here is an ID for this service and if you don't actually pass in a name, then it'll combine essentially the name of the chart, which is the, the, the larger. Okay, so CDKH uses the term chart to actually talk about essentially a, a set of artifacts that generate a singular YAML file. Um, that is different than a Helm chart. It is not a Helm chart, but it's also called chart. That's a little confusing. Um, gotcha, okay. So it, the, the convention is, is that if you don't actually go through and specify um, the uh, the name there explicitly, the default is constructed based on sort of the context that's actually being passed in. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. Um, cool. Uh, and then the ID can be referenced downstream. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So, all right. So now we actually have the web service.ts. And what this is actually doing is this is actually start trying to take this thing and sort of like put it into a reusable component. So now the interface here is going to be a heck of a lot easier. We have the image, number of replicas, the external port, and the internal port. Now, this makes some assumptions. This assumes that, you know, um, you're not doing any sidecars. You don't need to, to modify things like, you know, the. Uh, uh, the security properties of the thing, right? Like whether, you know, what user ID do you want to use inside of it if you're running as non-root? Um, you know, it, it assumes that you're not configuring any volumes, right? So there's a whole bunch of assumptions here because it's creating a super simple interface, which is great, 
but it's also hiding a lot of the flexibility of underlying Kubernetes. And so I think that's a lot of the trade-offs that you'll see as people try to simplify Kubernetes is that every single knob is there for a reason. And if you try and hide that knob, you're also then narrowing the applicability of the things that you can do with it. Sometimes that's okay. And sometimes that'll feel like uh, too limiting for users. And that's something to be aware of. All right, but in any case, um, what we see here is that we have image replicas port and container port uh, are the things. Those things actually are the properties that are passed in. And then, um, uh, and then those things turn into, uh, uh, those things turn into a bunch of, of uh, 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 local variables that then get used to actually generate the, um, the actual objects that are being dealt with. And, uh, and so this, this is a construct, and I guess constructs can uh, belong to charts and charts belong to apps. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the set of nouns, I believe, at least uh, that's my understanding of it. Okay, so let's go through and how do we then change our main to be able to use that. We'll go ahead and do that. And here we have, we're importing web service from lib web service. Um, and then our chart, we're essentially creating two, one's called hello Kubernetes and one's called ghost. Um, assuming that you have an image called ghost, which I don't know, is that a thing? Docker hub ghost. Oh, it's a blogging platform. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, and here we're saying, well, the container port is 2368 because apparently you know that's hard coded into that container image. Um, and then, uh, and then the defaults here, the default number of replicas is one. Gotcha, got it. Um, welcome back, Nova. Using TypeScript to generate YAML is kind of like using a dirty fork to eat rotten food. We need to convince Rob Pike to design a better scripting language. Well, John, funny you should mention this because you know, um, you know, same type of thing happened inside of GCP where some very, very smart people ended up. Uh, creating this thing called Deployment Manager, which was essentially using languages to be able to actually generate the config so that you can do deployment. So this idea of using a real language to generate the config, it's not something that I think is gonna go, go away anytime soon. Um, and, uh, and generating a new language has a really high bar. Uh, I think oftentimes there's a huge hump to be able to get over it and make it useful. And so basing it on something that's widely understood like JavaScript or Python makes a ton of sense. One of the things that we probably won't have time to get into here is testability. When you do use a real language ecosystem, you get the tooling, you get autocomplete, you get testing, all the other stuff that actually goes along with it. Inventing something new to solve all those problems from scratch is really, really hard. If you are looking for a new language in this space and you're, you know, I would take a look at Q. Um, which is really, really interesting. Um, uh, Q config language, uh, but is going to be facing some of the, the the similar things that I talked about, where it's different. People don't understand it. It doesn't have the larger ecosystem around it. And so I think those are the trade offs that we have to make when we think about this stuff. So yeah, so Chris, the way that it works is that you write TypeScript, TypeScript then uh, gets compiled to JavaScript, and then you run the JavaScript to generate the, the YAML. All right, so this is interesting because now what we're starting to do is we're starting to create a level of abstraction, and you can make this abstraction work for you, right? And so that means that like, hey, if you need to add a new thing in here, like let's say I wanted to change, I don't know, like the service account that I'm using, right? I can go through and I can do read only service account equals, you know, and I can then extend this with the parameters that matter for me that I'm gonna wanna be able to, to edit and modify. Um, but I won't do that right now because I'll start, um, I would love if they make it available for Kotlin too. I need to understand Kotlin. Now there is a Java, version of this and I don't know if that actually then is reusable with Kotlin or you can mix and match those things. I need to learn some Kotlin at some point. Um, add that to my list um, for sure. Uh, I don't know what this will look like. Java seems much more verbose than TS. Yeah, so one of the problems here is I think, you know, these types of situations 
Um, generating YAML structure from Go is actually pretty painful because of the way that Go handles types. It's not as freeform and loosey-goosey as something like Python or JavaScript. And so, so I think that there's definitely, um, uh, uh, for generating config, these you know, JavaScript and Python and loosely typed languages are, are definitely a lot easier in my mind, uh, to, to a lot easier to work with. All right, so let's go through. So, so we have um, in the background, the JavaScript is actually being compiled. Oh, you can see like when I was typing some bad things happen. Um, and now we can actually do the synth, which will generate it. And now if we go ahead and look at the output, which is in dist hello, now we have hello service, hello ghost service, um, and you know hello deployment and a hello ghost deployment. And so that's actually starts to show you the sort of higher levels of abstraction that you can build. And as the types of things that you're deploying get more complex, you can start adding the right helper functions to actually eliminate the sort of the repetition that you see happening in YAML. Uh, and, and being able to hoist that into the, into the Kubernetes world as necessary. All right, so that is, I think, that's the core example that leads us through this stuff. Now, one of the interesting things here is, you know, the, um, and, and, and this echoes some of the work that we did early on with Ksonnet also, but clearly we picked the wrong language with Jsonnet versus something like JSON, I mean, like uh, JavaScript, um, is that, what we have in imports here is we have, you know, this kates.ts, this is all programmatically generated based on the Kubernetes schemas. Um, and so it is raw, it is the raw schema, but just expressed into JavaScript with some generic helpers around things like metadata. Um, uh, the other half of this is this thing called uh, uh, CD Kates Plus. And what this is, is this is essentially, I believe, a set of handwritten wrappers that actually start to create a friendlier interface to the raw Kubernetes. And so it's one level removed. You can either work with raw Kubernetes and TypeScript, or you can start using the next level up with the CDK stuff. And because this stuff is actually going through, and this is um, uh, hand-tuned and, and written, um, what you'll see is that, oh, look, it's only available in Python and JavaScript, which ends up being interesting because that means that like, oh, the Java support doesn't do this because it's not automatically generated. There's a human sort of action to be able to ex extend these things and actually make this stuff work. Um, but this is a pattern that we see a lot is that you'll have uh, automatically generated stuff and then layered on top of that, you'll have things that are human generated for providing sort of a more thoughtful interface, higher level abstraction on top of it. Um, I think they just use JSI for cross language by, oh, okay. Yes, J, JSI, okay, my, my, uh, my mistake then, okay. So then the Python then actually calls the JavaScript, is that what happens? What is JSI? I haven't used it. This is any language can actually interact with JavaScript classes. Oh, wow, okay, so this is essentially, there's a lot of faces there. Ooh. Um, so this is essentially, do I know any of these people? I don't know. Um, okay, so this allows you to call Java, JavaScript from uh, other languages. Does it act, actually run a, 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 a JavaScript interpreter or does it actually uh, transliterate it? Into, into another language. I don't know, I'm really interested. I don't know, okay, well, that's not what we're, not what we're digging into. But in any case, so there's, there's the CD Kates Plus stuff that we can actually go ahead and start working with here. Um, and so we'll go ahead and install that because um, it's a separate library. And uh, let's go through and, and uh, copy and paste this and start going through this and seeing what this looks like. And so I'm just gonna whack my main.ts here.
So Sevi is saying, so usually there is you know, DevOps who cannot write TypeScript and devs that are not interested in YAMLs. Um, yeah, this is interesting. I think, you know, I, I think you're not wrong that I think in a lot of traditional organization, the folks in the ops roles are, you know, they'll do a little bit of bash or power script, but they don't really go, you know, they're not super comfortable oftentimes going super deep into say the JavaScript world or, or maybe Python is more accessible there. And oftentimes there's then development teams that are very much on the, on the path of like, well, I don't want to worry about that deployment stuff. That's somebody else's problems. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, these things that really start crossing the lines, uh, find an audience with, you know, essentially newer teams, whether it be a startup or, or what have you, but often struggle to actually adapt to these more traditional segmented roles. Um, and this is why something like CloudFormation or Terraform or what have you is actually fairly attractive because those things end up being coding without the coding. It doesn't feel like you have to deal with all the block and tackle of actually dealing with NPM and JavaScript and all that other stuff. Um, yeah, so I do think that, that, it, that it is interesting to actually see, you know, how do these different tools apply to different types of users and how do they view this world? Okay, so what do we got going on here? So we create a new cdkates.app, okay, a new chart. Um, and then here's K plus is, is, uh, is the uh, K, uh, CD Kates plus, and this is for 17 for 1.17, I assume is what it's, it's targeted at. So Robert says CD Kates loops and conditions save me massive amount of time when generating repetitive templates, which I really appreciate. Yeah, I think getting that looping or you know for each type of thing ends up being a critical piece of the puzzle. And if you've looked at the, um, the evolution of the underlying uh, language that Terraform uses, um, which is uh, HCL, you'll see that that they've added more and more of those those types of structures to be able to deal and more componentization as that language has evolved because that ends up being the critical thing there is actually being able to do those expansions across, you know, for each of my blahs, I wanna generate one of these, right? Um, and CDK and using a language like JavaScript is definitely a way to be able to do that. Uh, so let's create a volume that contains our app. We'll, uh, we use a trick with config map. So we're gonna do config map, app data, uh, add directory, dir name app. Oh wow, we're actually deploying an app into a config map. We create a volume from that. We're creating a thing and then we're essentially running node. Ha. I don't, I don't know what I think about this. <laughs> so the code for the actual app is showing up in a config map. That's probably not a good idea because there are limits on the size of config maps and at some point you will probably have too much. <laughs> but it's interesting, this is an interesting hack to be able to do that. Um, uh, okay, and so what we're actually seeing here is that there's, um, Instead of having to actually go through and specify deployment, we're using the K plus deployment. And, um, and we can then pass in, let's see, so we have, we're creating a config map and a volume and um, the deployment. And then we can talk to the deployment and actually build it up, including the mounts and stuff like that. So that ends up looking really, really interesting there. So you don't have to actually put all the YAML together explicitly, this has a bunch of helpers to be able to do it. All right, I'm gonna catch up on the on the comments here. Okay, uh, Justin says CDK has a parameters var equals val, but it doesn't look like it's available in CDKates right now. Okay, so eventually there may be a way to pass parameters into your program when you do the synth, but that's not something that's supported here. So when you write one of these things, what it produces is what it produces, and you're never gonna actually see it produce something different. Well, I guess you could have it read stuff from files or reach out and do other random things, but generally you don't pass anything in and on the command line. Uh, uh, talking about testing. Um, uh, uh, Terraform for each sure beats count, especially when you use a lot of dynamic blocks. Um, so with testing with this, you can generate the manifest and then just write assertions against that. 
uh, so you don't have to apply it. I have a kind cluster running, but I don't know if we're actually going to get to that in this. Um, large code base that I've seen in JSON it really make me wish that this was uh, Go and uh, TypeScript. Uh, yeah, need more Go. <laughs> All right, so cool. So, um, so yeah, so this is like, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't suggest this whole putting your putting your source code in a config map is a good idea, but it's really interesting to actually see we have this app data add directory here, which um, we can config map. What is that dot d dot ts? I'm confused. So this is the this is the types, and then oh, I see it's JavaScript. Okay, is this generated? But here you can see um, add data and add from files. This actually then knows how to use the JavaScript program to be able to read stuff and actually construct the config map for you. So being able to have code that actually can like do that is actually really interesting. And so that's a great example of this. Um, OK, so uh, boom, boom, boom. And then it goes through and it does expose. And what does expose do? Um, <laughs> so this actually then creates a service around it with type equals load balancer. Okay, so you know, cube control expose I think is going away if it's not already deprecated or gone, um, just because it's a little bit weird to to have an imperative thing to do that. Uh, that was a Brendan special back in the day. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, run synth. And then we can look at the YAML that ends up being created. And uh, OK, so what do we got? So we have our deployment here. Our deployment has a, oh wait, no, this is the old one. Did something, did it not compile? Oh, import my chart from main. Wait, did I? Was I not supposed to, did I do this wrong? At a glance. What am I? Okay. Um, all right, sorry about this. I'm, I'm digging into what's going on here. So we got, okay, so we got an error in the, so this is module main has no exported member my chart. This feels like something changed here because this is not working for me. For here, we call app synth, but in our, our previous getting started tutorial, you just create something called class my chart. Oh, here we have my chart hello. So who where is my chart coming in here? So what's going on here? What am I doing wrong? The module main has no exported member my chart. Oh, the test. It's just the test that's failing. Got it. Okay. Um, sorry, my mistake. Test.ts. Um, Let's just uh, what is that section? I is it? It's I always forget the toggle block comment. There we go. So we'll do that. There we go. Okay. So now we're good. Now we can s call synth. All right, so it's mad. What is it mad about? 
util scander e no int app. Oh, so it's looking for, okay, so yeah, it's looking for the directory called app. I'm just gonna call, let's, uh, let's uh, just pick a random directory to put in, or I'm gonna create a directory called app. There we go, okay. So now we have um, dist my chart here. And here we have foo, which is empty, which is read from the file. We have a deployment. And so we can see that like all the labels are actually uh, threaded through and there's a default label with CDK so you actually know where that came from. Um, and then, um, Here's the command, and it's mounting the config map as a volume and uh, uh, making that available there. Sweet. And then having the service actually point to it. So this is, you know, this is a fairly complex configuration where we have a config map that we're then mounting in and then we're uh, into a certain place. And then we have a, a container that's using that um, uh, config map and then we're exposing it um, and so generating the config map from stuff that's actually sitting on disk so that's a relatively complex configuration and you know I like reading this you know this looks relatively straightforward where I'm creating the config map with my source code uh, and then I'm going through and I'm then creating the deployment I especially like the sort of the mount syntax here because essentially what we're doing is two things, is that we're, we're, um, we're taking this volume here and we're mounting it uh, into this container. So it's a container thing. So if we had multiple containers and we had the same volume on both containers, I bet you behind the scenes, this thing looks at the list of volumes and says, oh, this volume already exists let me go ahead and actually reuse it and mount it into another container. And so one of the things I think, you know, the, the, the reference here that we have with, with Kubernetes that's kind of in sometimes um, can be uh, uh, frustrating is that I have to come up with a name for the volume just so that I can refer to that volume from within the container. And, um, you know, there's a lot of cases where you're gonna have a volume that's only used by one container. Why didn't we just go ahead and say, hey, put the volume directly in the container? Well, that's because we wanted to actually make room for the case where you had the same volume mounted in different locations across multiple containers in the same pot. That's a relatively rare case, but, there, but people have to sort of pay the cognitive price of understanding that even if they're not using it. Whereas I think when you have a, an interface like this, I really like how it's actually going through and saying, well, here's the thing mounted into this thing, and it skips all that sort of plumbing and referencing that's happening under the covers in the YAML. So that's really cool. Joe, I thought you would prefer a slew of bash scripts to auto-generating the YAML. This would be a nice clean solution to generate manifest in a CI CD pipeline. I, I, I think that um, I'm not a fan of writing YAML by hand. I think it's actually like, I think it's good for understanding Kubernetes to understand what's happening and, you know, understanding pods versus deployments and how these things are threaded together. Um, but I think for most, most users, they're doing simpler things. They don't actually need to be able to do that. So I'm a huge fan of building higher level toolkits on top of this stuff so that you can actually go through and, and really streamline the, uh, uh, the experience here. So I actually think there's some really cool stuff here. Um, I don't know if I would do expose here. I would probably say, you know, creating the, 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 the load balancer service ingress stuff. I would have that be a separate thing that you then attach this to. But, you know, I think, you know, there's different ways to view this for sure. Nova says, I like reading YAML a lot. Writing YAML can be hard. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think YAML, like the explicitness of YAML is a good thing. Like there's no room for ambiguity. Um, but that makes it super painful to be able to actually, you know, write to. Um, so that's, uh, okay. So let's see, let's um, do one more thing here before we actually call it a day. Um, let's go through and um, 
So here's the examples that we went through. So there's the hello Kubernetes. There's this web service abstraction that I think, you know, we, uh, and they have like, yeah, so this is the thing that, that we already did, okay. Um, and then there's one with CRDs. And I would like, and we're not gonna have time to do the, the Python stuff. So this is really interesting here. Uh, um, so what we have here is we have, all right, this is confusing me here. We have cdkates.yaml has a bunch of imports, language TypeScript. How does this work? All right, so let's um, let's clone this in and see if we can actually make it work real quick before. Uh, finally, pa case sensitive pass on. A oh, you got to be kidding me! Ah. Uh, <laughs> Somebody likes using Windows. <laughs> um, let's see. So, um, so CD Kate's. Um, let's bring up VS Code. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. So if we go and we look at the, if we go to examples, TypeScript, um, sorry, folks are calling and texting me and stuff. Uh, okay, so the CRD, okay. So let's actually just uh, see what happens there. Um, CD, Example, CD, TypeScript, CD, CRD. Okay, so one of the things here is if I do CD, Kate, and if I do import, does that just, okay. This is interesting. Okay, so this is actually now pulling in a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, we now have imports, and here's the, the, the Kubernetes one that we had before, right? And this is that like huge ass file that we had. Um, but now what we actually have is we have a bunch of CRDs got pulled in also, so we can start operating with those in a similar way. And I think the interesting thing here, and now th this is something that I think is really cool is that um, just like, you know, you have a config file that is like your package lock or, or your, you know, um, the TS config or package.json, you know, or GoDepths um, in Go, we actually have a, uh, um, a similar type of thing for CD Kates. And, uh, and what you can say here is it's saying, okay, I want to import Kubernetes at version 1.17. Um, here's like a raw sort of YAML file with the, uh, so there's a syntax here where, where you can actually get these things from different directions. And so one of these things like version.yaml is a simple custom resource definition that doesn't actually have a, uh, a schema associated with it. So this is an old school type of thing. Um, and so we can look at, this is probably the simplest one and this is foos.sample controller or sample, con okay. So that would be this one here. And so that generated, that turned into this thing here where we have foo as an API object. Um, it has the group version kind, it has props and that's it. So super duper simple. Um, whereas I think, you know, we can get into more complex stuff like here's Mattermost um, has a more complex thing with a full schema. And then that turns into this. 
And what you can see is now there's a whole bunch of help in terms of setting the schema to make sure that you get type safety when you're actually working with the schema. So that's really interesting to actually see that there. Uh, Guillaume says, I have a lot of issue importing CRDs to have the full code generation here must have an open API spec declared. So not all CRDs will be correctly imported. I tried with Tekton and it didn't generate all the interfaces. Yeah, I think this is one of those things where, you know, with CRDs, only with the V1 versions of CRDs did it start requiring the full schema for it. But like, there's a certain question of like, if you don't have the schema, what are you gonna do, right? I think that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the, the situation that we're in. But I really like, I mean, so the things that I, uh, that I like here is I do like that there's an explicit sort of like listing of here's all the things that you're importing. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about just sort of downloading random stuff off the internet here, but I guess that works. I mean, it's up to you to make sure that you uh, 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 pick a stable URL that's not gonna be changing, otherwise you can get some really weird behavior out of it. Um, and then I think it just goes to show that like, you know, this idea of having schemas with CRDs really starts to elevate them such that we can build real tooling around them that is just like the built-in Kubernetes uh, object. So that's actually cool. All right, so we're, we're I think we're, I'm heading to the end here. Um, I, you know, we could dig in and actually try and run this, but I think, you know, gives you a sense of sort of what you can do to start pulling this stuff in and how this actually plays into the larger ecosystem. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really, I think this stuff is cool. The things that I really like about it is that uh, it's part of a tool chain. We're just generating YAML, we're not applying it. And so this actually gives you a lot of room to, to be able to use it with a GitOps flow or with, you know, uh, um, you know uh, other tooling like CAP to be able to deploy it. I think that's really cool. The, um, uh, uh, Steve, I see you asking about the shirt. I'll explain the shirt in a second. This is uh, uh, back when we were able to travel through airports and it turned into one of my favorite shirts. Um, so things that I like. So I like that. Um, I think one of the things that's missing is parameterization. The fact that there's no way to pass in command line arguments to this thing. I think, you know, you may want to have something along the lines of like, let's say that you want to you know, deploy something to 10 different clusters. And you may want to actually pass in some of the different parameters for some of the different clusters as you actually generate this. So instead of being able to script that from the outside, you then have to actually script it on the inside, which, which probably j creates a certain level of uh, impedance mismatch as you're trying to integrate this with other tool chains. Um, so that's something that I'd like, I think should probably, uh, uh, I, I would look to improve. I think in general, I think this class of solution, the sort of the cloud development kit in general, it's very much aimed at developers. It assumes that you're a developer, you're comfortable working in a language like Python or JavaScript or Java or whatever. And, uh, and, and you find that as an accelerator, as a booster. I think that's also a downside because there's a whole lot of folks that interact with Kubernetes as operators that aren't comfortable actually getting involved in this world and it turns into something that's super, super intimidating. So I think, you know, we want to make Kubernetes easier for folks to use. And I think, you know, what easy means is actually changes depending on who you are, right? Like, so some folks putting a real programming language on it is like, finally, this is super easy. I understand what's happening here. For other folks, this will actually be a real turnoff because they're like, oh God, now like, I'm not a programmer, how do I actually do this? Now, you and I might say, oh, it's not that hard, it's just a little bit of TypeScript and you know, blah, blah, blah. But like, there's, there's quite the complexity hill to climb here if you're not already, if this isn't already part of your skill set. And I don't think this is a knock on sort of CDK in general. I just think it's like how hard this problem is, is that there is really no one size fits all solution. All right, and so that's, um, um, Justin says, it would be nice if there is a TypeScript starter for ops to use CDKs. I, I think that's that's the case, I think. But one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of ops folks, they understand Bash, right? The, there's a reason why Bash is never going away. And it's because you start with something that's like super easy and then you build incrementally that skill set on top of it. Um, I think we see the same thing happen with PowerShell on the Windows side, right? It's like, it's like, oh, I already know all this stuff. Let me just add incrementally on top of it. I think even if we did have a gentle introduction to TypeScript for operators, it still would be this hump where it's like, okay, I'm gonna have to set 
aside a couple of days to really dig into this versus like, well, I'm just going to learn this by osmosis. Um, there's this book that I started reading I'm in the middle of that I think is really interesting. Let me find a, a link for it. Um, uh, 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 give me a second here. Um, it's, um, it's called Range. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this one. Um, let me go ahead and switch back. Um, this is really, really, you can see I purchased this on, on, on Christmas Eve during my time off. Um, this is a really interesting book because it's essentially the anti 10,000 hours and it talks about different types of learning and, uh, and different types of expertise and the places where uh, computers and machine learning can do well versus where you need human intuition and judgment about how computers can be really good at, at tactics, but humans are good at strategy. Um, and one, the chapter that I just finished reading in it starts to talk about like um, uh, what does it take to learn and really build mastery over something. And there's a lot of data, and I don't know sort of how general, the, general this is, but there's a lot of data out there that says that um, if you train for the exam and you learn the exam, you do well on the exam, you think you learned it, but it's not really durable. So this is idea of durable learning. and um, Whereas if you use something day to day and you actually put it in context and the learning is painful, right? And you have the battle scars from the learning, that's the place where you actually have the retention. And so easy learning is not durable. And so I think that's one of the reasons why things like, you know, uh, uh, like, okay, for me, like the half-life of Python in my brain is probably, I mean, not Python, Perl in my brain is probably about two weeks because I've never actually used Perl in anger for any length of time. And so therefore I learn it long enough to do something or to edit something and then it immediately disappears out of my head. And so again, I think this is actually, you know, I think this is this is exactly right, Steve, that like Kubernetes the hard wave and I've, I've given Kelsey a hard time on this because Kubernetes the hard way is exactly the wrong way to build a production Kubernetes cluster, right? You will not you will not actually end up in a good situation if, 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 if you really take on management to that level of detail without using tooling. It is an amazing way to actually learn about Kubernetes and actually dig under the covers because you have those battle scars, you have the paper cuts, you, you understand what happens because you've suffered through it. And so I think that that's, it's, um, that I think does play to this. If, like, if you have the battle scars of learning JavaScript and the battle stars of actually, scars of becoming a developer, something like CDK makes a ton of sense. If all of your battle scars are around you know, Bash, then, then CDK may actually end up being really, really daunting because there is that sort of, I have to be a programmer hump that not everybody has gotten over. I don't know, I'm kind of hand waving here, but that's my sort of theory on this stuff a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm gonna finish off, I'm gonna talk about my shirt. So uh, 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 before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot and uh, and uh, usually I do like day trips down to the Bay Area where it's like you leave really, really early in the morning, you catch like a 6 a.m. flight out of Seattle, Tacoma, get down to the Bay Area and then I'll be home around like, I don't know, 10 or 11, really long day. Once in a while, I would uh, uh, stay overnight. And so, you know, oftentimes I'll have another bag. Well, I went, uh, I was doing a, like an overnight trip and I got to the airport only to realize that like my bag was still at home. <laughs> and so I, I had to play that game of like, okay, what do I need to buy in the airport so that like, you know, I can stuff it in my backpack and I'm not gonna actually be, uh, uh, be embarrassed the next day by not having clean clothes. And so this is actually from the, uh, um, from the, um, uh, uh, which I'm gonna call it, um, record label in Seattle. Man, I'm really blanking today. Um, God, and they have a store in SeaTac. Someone help me here. So now I'm gonna look it up. So hey Google, record label in Seattle. Uh, what, 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 Sub Pop. So this is a Sub Pop t-shirt that I picked up on the airport because I actually forgot my bag. I also got a pair of socks and a pair of undies out of it, but this has been the most durable. Actually, it's a really nice t-shirt. And so it's uh, uh, it's almost worn out now. Yes, I've washed it many times. It's getting kind of threadbare. <laughs> so that was a while ago. 
So yeah, so it's a it's a space needle, and I think it's a uh, like a Sasquatch. Um, my only regret is that it's a hexagon and not a heptagon. But what are you gonna do? <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I will uh, uh, say have a great weekend. Thank you for joining me. Let's hope that we have a good 2021 together. Uh, get over the pandemic and let's uh, let's build a, a a fair, more equitable, calmer future together. Um, thank you, everybody, and uh, see you later.